And uh, the judge brought donuts, which normally we'd have made a fuss over, but the dog treats that uh, Rhea was just scarfing down during that whole interview. <laughs> she did. Must have had about 100 of those things. Right? She was nervous. <laughs> uh, she, uh, for a puppy to sit still in a chair yeah. and not be napping, that's pretty good. That, that yeah. took a lot to keep that, uh, that little pup constrained. I wonder how many little pockets of treats there are throughout the courthouse <laughs> <laughs> from people who are sneaking stuff to her. Our guest in this segment is uh, John Everson from uh, Ameriprise Financial and the Myriad's Group of Financial Advisors on Winchester Avenue, Martinsburg. John, good morning, sir. Good morning, gentlemen. But I got Rob. I got to register a complaint right up front. Yes, sir. How am I? How am I supposed to follow <laughs> that that uh, that segment that was in front of me? You know, I'm not cute. I'm not cuddly. I don't scarf treats. But you know, it's uh, and 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 think about this. Given the news for our industry. I don't know if there's going to be many rays of sunshine in our industry today. <laughs> yeah, Phil picked a heck of a morning to not have to take the abuse. Uh, you you yes, get it. Yes, he did. Well, but think about it. What what a uh, an appropriate time, perhaps, to bring the uh, old, experienced, grizzled veteran in off of the bench to fill in on the radio than the guy who's who's done this now for about 40 years and has been through more of these news events and swings and, you know, uh, Periods of hysteria mm -hmm. on occasion than, uh, than someone who's uh, who's done this for close to four decades. Oh, well, that's a great point. Uh, all of us in this room have been through many sell-offs, uh, ebbs and flows uh, with the market, and uh, inevitably, when you come back ten years later, the numbers are always much higher than they were uh, at the low point. But John, this one seems to be as nonsensical as any of the ones that I've seen before of this magnitude, the, the Nikkei down 12.4%. I mean, that's that's crazy. The Kospi down 8.77%. Uh, domestically here, the tech market to the NASDAQ has sold off 5 and 2 thirds percent. Uh, these really seem to be overly exaggerated based on a couple of reports that really weren't that horrible. Yeah, very good. In fact, it's interesting because I was thinking about... Uh, the segment of this morning over the weekend, and it's kind of putting it into perspective so far year to date. And I remember when I was a, uh, a child, my mother used to uh, do a lot of canning in the summertime. And, you know, uh, financial markets right now, I think some of what we're experiencing is kind of some of that, like a, uh, a steam release, a pressure release, if you will, that, uh, you know, because, you know, we've had a good year, particularly if you go back. Uh, coming from November 1st of 2023, coming forward to where we are right now, we've been on a tear in uh, equities in particular. And so the fact that we're having a little bit of a, uh, a sell-off, sort of a, a pressure release, if you will, uh, doesn't surprise me, uh, number one. Number two, though, what I, th I found very interesting, much like you, Rob, is, you know, sort of, uh, and that's why we always remind people, sometimes the trigger. It was almost, you know, the fact, I mean, think about this, you know, when you look around, as, I, as we, I, I tell people here in the office, you know, when you go buy gas and groceries, what's your takeaway when, you know, after that experience, do you feel good about where things are, you know, the outlook and so forth? And most people respond with, well, no, not really. And there's been a little bit of a disconnect, I think, be, be, behind how well sort of the economy was chugging along and where financial markets actually were. So the fact that we're having a, a bit of a sell-off uh, really is not that surprising at all. You know, this is strictly anecdotal, but I uh, was uh, vacationing with family uh, in, in July and uh, talked to my uh, sister and to my nephew's wife. And both were talking about trying to find summer employment because their jobs dictate that they're unemployed for the summer and then they work basically the equivalent of a school year and neither one of them could find a job any any kind of job this summer to work it wasn't like they're saying well that one doesn't pay well enough this one is beneath me i'm too good for that any kind of job they couldn't find one this summer not that kind of raised some alarms john because for the longest time, we've been looking around. There's been help wanted signs everywhere. Oh, we can't find enough people to wait tables. We can't find enough people to do the dirty work, that sort of thing. And I guess that's no longer the case. Yeah, so it's, it's very interesting you bring that up. 
um, reading some internal um, information from our uh, Global Asset Allocation Committee. Uh, one of the comments that they made, and I'm going to read you, uh, this is a quote, over the last six months, net job growth has averaged a strong plus 224,000 per month. So the fact that last week we had, what was it, 114,000 net new jobs were added, and that apparently is sort of has been the trigger that kind of causes this, and everybody leaps, you know, plays that forward. Oh, you know, now we're we're headed toward a recession and so forth. The fact that 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 uh, jobs have slowed down a little bit is not really uh, that you know that surprising because again, you know, so far year to date. Uh, job growth had actually been uh, you know, pretty strong. Billy, uh, good morning, John. Uh, John, two questions, and they're not related at all, but uh, uh, one, not only has the market been going down, the Treasury yields have been going down, and the question is why. The second question is, and again, not related to the first, is that artificial intelligence has been getting such a phenomenal amount of press recently as going to be the gateway to the future, but yet AI stocks have also been taking a big hit. Both of those in order, what you're thinking? Yeah, a great question. Uh, I'll start with the, the second one first, which is, you know, if you stop and you think about it, uh, the artificial intelligence stocks have had a phenomenal run-up over the most recent you know, again, a year, year and a half almost. And so the fact that, again, that, that we're experiencing a bit of a sell-off, a bit of a pullback, uh, some cooling down there, again, doesn't necessarily surprise me uh, at all because, you know, some of that action is actually uh, fairly normal kinds of things. And I don't know that there's necessarily, for, for something like that, that there's cause and effect other than the fact that they have climbed dramatically. Okay, and that, it may be as simple as that. You know, with regard to um, uh, Treasury yields, you think about it. You know, and I think right now one of the things that we're uh, we're seeing is, um, and I, I and I wish it wasn't this way. Everybody is so uh, hyper focused on what's the Fed's next move. You know, when are they going to start to lower interest rates and so forth. And so as a result, you know, bonds right now have become fairly volatile simply because of uh, anticipation of what everybody thought was going to occur earlier in the year. I mean, you know, if we go back about a year ago, the prediction, the estimation uh, from the Fed was, well, you know, we anticipate things to be strong enough that, you know, we can start to lower interest rates as we, uh, we roll forward through 2024. There was a you know kind of an estimation that that was going to happen multiple times. That hasn't happened yet, and we're uh, we're now into the eighth month of the year. Okay, so I think what we're seeing right now really is just a, uh, a lot of volatility spilling back over even into uh, some of the bond sectors that normally you wouldn't necessarily see. That is, I think, predicated upon uh, anticipation of what has uh, is is probably going to come, but simply hasn't happened yet. Johnny Gilstrap. Well, as the forever pessimist in the room when it comes to th to the economy, um, yeah, I, I think that we're not seeing an overreaction to a couple of reports. I think we might be seeing people waking up to the fact that the underpinnings of the economy suck. We've got people spending huge amounts of money at the individual level that they don't have. We see personal credit just through the roof we have the government spending all of the money that we don't have um and and it, this i found really startling today as i was listening to the news that as the stock markets are tanking so are gold and silver so isn't that really unusual that we see the commodities going down at the same time we see equities going down isn't the, this kind of the harbinger yeah. of of oddness and perhaps bad things uh, yeah, yes, with a twist, though. There's a, the answer to that would be yes with a however, and you got to remember this. We're only two years removed from 2022 where we experienced some of the highest inflation that we've seen in the last, you know, 35, 40 years. Remember this, hard assets, commodities, uh, gold, uh, precious metals, things of that nature, tend to move, you know, in periods of high inflation, uh, those tend to become uh, an inflation hedge. The, the price
price, the value of those really spike up. So the fact that we're starting to see a bit of a pullback there right now, again, that's kind of a cyclical thing that does not necessarily surprise me. Now, uh, John, you mentioned something that is, uh, and I, I will concur with your concern. I don't know if you saw this or not. Just about a week ago, maybe a week and a half ago, there was an article talking about uh, U.S. consumer debt for the first time in history, did you see the dollar value that we've now cracked? I did not. One, it was one trillion dollars of consumer debt that Americans now carry. That's a staggering sum. That's a sum, you know, that is akin on an individual level to what our federal government has done. Uh, you know, we went over thirty into thirty-four trillion dollars of debt in January of this year. We cracked thirty-five trillion just um, uh, about a week and a half ago. And so you think about this, we're now adding about a trillion dollars roughly every six to seven months to the national debt. At some point, you, you know, people, you, people, governments, entities, corporations cannot continue to live on borrowed money. And that, I, I won't disagree with you, that is, that is a legitimate concern. And, uh, you know, but, but you think about it, Particularly on the uh, the personal side of things, the individual consumer side of things, you know, when you talk about, well, you know, why are people running up such such high debt? Well, I think it's as simple as, you know, they've got uh, items in their grocery cart and they need to get through the door into the parking lot. And so there's a lot of people who simply don't have then that cash to cover, you know, just basic month to month month expenses, and they're uh, they're going in debt right now trying to live and, and that, that's problematic there's no question about that and this is where the gaslighting comes in i'm not talking about from you i'm talking this is a political yeah. year this is where the economy is strong <laughs> we've never had a better economy in all that but what you just said is the case people are spending money they don't have to buy groceries this this is unsustainable it's kind of like there had to be a moment after the Titanic hit the iceberg, where somebody said, oh, that's not, that was just a little shimmy. That's not important. Let's just keep on going. Uh, <laughs> and, you know, I just, I, I worry about this. And yeah. I, don't, I don't see, because it is a political, every year, every moment is a political moment these days. I don't see anybody, Jerome included, saying, you know what? This is a, this is a real problem. We need to stop doing what we're doing and have a hard reset and, and start rethinking everything we're thinking about the economy. And um, so, this, as I often do during this segment, I don't know if there's a question in there. It's, it's, my, it's my expression of frustration. I think he's running out the clock so Bill can't get another question in. Yeah, yeah. Well, well, well think, think about this. As I often refer to it, our, our industry is one where – so since you don't really have a question, I'll give you not really an answer. Okay? <laughs> I like that. Uh, as, I like, as I like to refer to this, our industry is, I remember when I was in school, when we were all in school, when you were in math and science classes, there were right answers and there were wrong answers. Two plus two was always going to be four, correct? Okay. But if you think about it, and, you know, uh, science class said chlorophyll is why grass is always green, Okay. But you go into an art class, and if the four of us are sitting in, you know, the different corners of a room, and the instructor says, I want you to paint a picture of the sunset. If, you know, we are, you know, where we can't see one another's work, at the end of that class period, if we, we compare, we all have a different-looking answer. You know, our color palette's different. You know, one might be a, you know, a mountain scene. One might be a, a scene over water. One might be a scene off of your, uh, your, 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 your back deck and so forth. And my point is that, you know, our industry is one that we remind people of this all the time. There are not necessarily right answers. You have to look at what answers are right for the individual. Uh, and, you know, because, again, that's, that's where I get frustrated sometimes with a lot of the, the information. The, the availability of data today is, is probably too much because there's a lot of people that don't know how to use that. In other words, they'll, they'll hear, for example, in fact, I actually saw this morning uh, here in the office, we, we, we joke that there are two words that we really love, and I do say that tongue-in-cheek. Those two words are plunge and plummet, okay? And I actually read one of those this morning in, a, uh, in an article about how markets are, are plunging. And think about this, P 
plunge is never that that is that word is designed to elicit emotion that is intended to um, uh, have have negative connotations. To to be involved in anything that plunges is never a good thing. If you're on an airplane and it's plunging, you've got a problem. If you're in an elevator car and it starts to plunge, that's a problem. If you have a toilet that you have to plunge, <laughs> it's because you have a problem, right? So so. You know, it, it's, it's really interesting, and that's why we remind people that, look, you really have to look at this stuff on an individual basis, and that's one of the reasons why we're, we're huge advocates to, that people make sure that they, they get control over uh, the things that they're pursuing on an individual basis. And, uh, you know, so, you know, as, as someone rolls toward retirement, our preference is, look, you've got to get your, your debt under control, ideally get it eliminated, get it to a point where, you know, you're not – uh, obligated to where you have to have certain volumes of cash flow coming on a month-to-month basis because once once you do that you know that that becomes problematic during times like this because there are inflations you know an ever known ever present fact it's always going to be with us uh, variable financial markets are you know are, are, are here to stay that's that's going to happen so we just like you know as I like to refer to it we like to have, for people to have extra slack in the rope in terms of how they uh, they go about making financial decisions. John Everson, our guest here on the program from Ameriprise Financial and the Myriad Group of Financial Advisors, Winchester Avenue, Martinsburg. Go ahead, Bill. Yeah, I was going to say, uh, we have two uh, two demographics. We're talking about the individuals, and, and I think individuals are smart enough that most of them are going to be able to kind of make their own value judgment. So I don't worry too, too much about the individuals um, in, in total. Uh, it's the government that I'm most concerned about. And it's the the debt that we're facing, uh, but yet the debt is primarily being driven by uh, Social Security, Medicare, and the and the like. And these are the third rail in our political system. Uh, how are we going to address the debt? Uh, without taking some hard looks at our uh, entitlement programs. And now it's going to be easy to say, well, we'll just cut the fat out of government. Uh, that's a throwaway statement. It's uh, what's fat to someone is critical to someone else. Uh, so it kind of comes back to entitlements. What you're thinking on that, John? Well, uh, Mr. Stofield, I actually do agree with you <clears throat> relative to uh, – it's interesting because when you said you know consumer debt <coughs> – wasn't necessarily what concerned you. Uh, I knew exactly where you were headed when you said it's 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 government uh, obligations. And for me, it kind of comes down to, and I've said this a lot over the years. I don't know that. <coughs> excuse me. I don't know necessarily that there's a lot of our uh, uh, elected leaders, con- congressional uh, delegates and representatives, who really have a good um, underpinning of financial concepts. You know. There, there are many that, that come across as if, you know, money can be printed, and unfortunately, that's what continues to happen. But the reality is, you know, you cannot continue to spend the money that you do not have. Now, how you solve a lot of those issues, maybe that's the reason why I'm not a politician, is because, you know, uh, some of the, the hard cuts that would have to be made would be unpopular, and so – you know, but I think, you know, and sadly, you know, they always view it as, well, you know, if we're running a deficit, well, we just, just need to raise more revenue. No, we need to control the spending. And as, as we all know, spending only does one thing in the context of time. It continues to rise and it continues to increase. So there's no question. I, 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 I can't disagree with you at all. Uh, likewise, that is a, a concern, and it's a very real concern. Bill, Center on Budget and Policy. Uh, says that 21% of the federal budget is Social Security, 21% is Medicare, and 18% is Medicaid. So that adds up to 60%. That does not take into account defense spending. That's right. Which leaves discretionary yeah, spending at about 17%. Yeah, think about it. defense spending and then uh, interest on the uh, the current government debt makes up probably then that balance. Yes, and if you add every trillion you add, and right now rates are at around 6.5% or so, that's another $65 billion on a trillion dollars of debt that we just added on top of that $34 million that existed. Yeah. So the bottom line, uh, Rob, if you take all those off the table, what's left 
will be things that uh, is funding our highways, funding our No, what you do, security. I think there's an incremental approach. People have this all or nothing idea about this. There's an incremental approach to this. And you start with people who are now young. So if you're 25, pick a number. I don't know what the right number is. But you just adjust to the fact that your Social Security retirement age isn't at 65. It's now at 70. And for people in the in the military, your retirement time isn't at 20 years, it's at 23 years. And once you retire, you don't start collecting retirement pay on the day you retire, you start re collecting retirement pay when you're 55. You don't, and I'm just, these are random numbers that yeah. I'm making, but, but, but it's, my, it's this, it, but that's, that all adds up to but billions my, of dollars. My, billions. Yeah, you're exactly right, John. My point was not how to fix Medicare or how to fix Social Security. I think you're exactly right on how to do that. My point was if you do not, if if you if they're still on the table, there's not a lot left that you can cut. You're talking about the infrastructure, some of the uh, programs that we have. De as John pointed out, defense, defense rather, and Social Security and Medicare and the like, that's close to 90% of our budget. Let me get back to John Emerson here so that he can get back to his day in a couple of minutes here. John, uh, how much of this do you put on Jerome Powell, if any, the Fed chair and the way he's handled interest rate hikes and then uh, possibly uh, a decrease coming up in the near future? Yeah, great great question. Here's here's how I put this uh, into context. You know, that's a tough job because, again, remember, there isn't a right answer until you Monday morning quarterback the result, right? So... You know, uh, you know, I think that, you know, where we are right now, again, you know, it's the, the recognition, the belief that where are we economically <clears throat> and the fact that unemployment numbers, numbers are now beginning to, uh, you know, uh, spike back up a little bit. GDP uh, growth is, is, in fact, slowing down. Again, at some point, they're going to have to make some move and make no mistake. That's the reason why an event like today or what we've seen you know, last Thursday, Friday, last week, so far really in the month of August, the volatility, keep that into perspective because as soon as the Fed makes a move to, uh, to lower rates, we're probably going to get an emotional reaction to that moving back in the other direction. So now I think right now it's really important that people keep a, a couple things in mind. Number one, when you hear events like this, uh, you know, things like this that are going on, don't panic. Keep your emotion in check. And remember, oftentimes emotionally driven financial decisions or sometimes we do the opposite of what we probably should have done if we were applying proper uh, financial logic, you know, to that. And and as I always like to uh, to remind people, you know, you know, no matter what you're saving money for, whatever the, your your individual financial goals happen to be, um, you know, I'll be 63 here in another two and a half months, something like that. Money that's, that's earmarked for my retirement, even if I were going to retire sometime within the next couple of years, which that's not necessarily the case. So I don't want people to start saying John said on the radio he was, he was leaving. That's not the case. But even if I were going to retire soon, I'm not going to use all of the money that I've saved for retirement on the first day or in the first week or in the first month. So as I like to refer to it, even 85 and 90-year-old individuals still buy green bananas because they're thinking further down the road. So for me, it's 63. I'm still going to need, if I'm here at 93, I'm going to need money 30 years from now. That's a long time to, uh, you know, put asset management into perspective. John, on that note, how can people get in touch with you at Ameriprise Financial and the Myriad Group of Financial Advisors for more information? Yep, we are located at 1270 Winchester Avenue right here in Martinsburg, West Virginia. Uh, they can reach us uh, by phone at area code 304-263-463. John, thank you so much. Say hey to Lisa for us. Sure will. Gentlemen, have a good day. Thanks, you too. John. You too.